And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Deb Carr. Uh, Deb has served as executive director of Intuit since 2014. Her passion is for the role museums can play in social good and increasing museum relevance through programming focused on bringing the marginalized into community. During her 17-year career at the world-renowned Shedd Aquarium, she held progressively responsible roles, serving as executive vice president for 11 years. In 2013, she won a Distinguished Teaching Award from Northwestern University's School of Professional Studies, where she has taught museum management since 2005. She is a frequent guest speaker on issues related to museum relevance, museum planning, teen empowerment, and activating the public for social good. Deb. Thank you, Allison. So um, we are, you heard at lunch, if you were able to join us for lunch, that um, our planned speaker, Karin Fall, got uh, grounded in Brussels. But that doesn't mean we can't have her with us through technology. So Karin is going to join us. Um, uh, once again, can we have a big round of applause for Edward Gomez, who, who stepped in, he stepped in at, uh, it doesn't feel like last minute because he was so remarkable, who stepped in and talked about Jean Dubuffet for us at lunch and is also going to sit in on our afternoon panel about place and artist. So um, with that, let me move to Karin. She is an art historian with a focus on outsider art. She is the artistic director of Central for Contemporary Art in Brussels and the director of R. Image, a museum of works by both formally trained and self-taught artists, while providing art space for people with mental disabilities. Uh, welcome, Karine. Welcome, I will. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for having me uh, from distance from Brussels, and sorry not to be there. Very straight, frustrating for me not to be there. So uh, my contribution to this panel was to speak uh, about the uh, importance of place. And uh, the first part of my contribution is to speak about the importance of personal encounters. So the first image that you see here is, of course, Adolf Wolfli, that you all know, um, because he was the first uh, author that was... Um, uh, who uh, Mar Walter Morgenthal wrote a book um, uh, about him um, and gave him a place, in fact, in the in the outsider art. So that encounter with that psychiatrist was very important. As also in this next image, uh, Aloise uh, Corbaz, that was also uh, shown by uh, Hans Steck, the psychiatrist, um, in the psychiatric hospital to the to the students. So there again, uh, Hans Steck gave. A Place to Alois Corbat and gave her a possibility also in the institution to create. The next image is maybe less known, is the image of Michael Nobel, uh, who created a studio. He was a sculptor and he created a studio in uh, an Italian psychiatric center where Carlo Zinelli made a remarkable uh, oeuvre. So there again, the place and the encounter are very important. The next image is uh, Navratil with uh, Hauser. And, uh, of course, Navratil uh, created the house the Künstler in Guggen, nearby Vienna, a place where they lived and created. And you see that fantastic image also in the next uh, image of uh, one of the images of the work of uh, Hauser uh, that was analyzed by a psychiatrist, uh, uh, Leo Navratil, that not only gave a place to him in that house of Guggen, but also gave a place to him in the outsider art world and in the art world in general. So the next image is uh, the, the room and the place in which Vala was creating. So for him, the possibility, uh, Navratil gave him the possibility to work in this own place, place and to give it his own identity. And that's also so specific and that's a, a real important evolution uh, in the psychiatry also that Navratil gave the possibility to these creators to have their own space in the psychiatric center in that house uh, 
der, of the, der Künstler. As you see in the next image, uh, you will see the, the artist on the house, in the house, before the house, uh, where they can live and they can create. Of course, lots can be told about that place, about how it was run uh, in the history, but uh, that's not the important element for the moment. Another example that I want to show um, is the example of Josef Hofer, that is an, an artist that is working uh, in Austria in, and um, who was helped and really considered by a woman that is not a psychiatrist, but that really uh, helps him to create, and that is Elisabeth Telsnik. Um, she, so uh, Hofer is uh, deaf and mute, and she helped uh, him to protect, she protected him, in fact, also from the commercial world, because the evolution of the outsider world, art world, is in the last last 10 years has uh, changed a lot also of course of the commercialization and one of the elements that is for me very important in my way of showing this work is the ethical element but that's another discussion that that maybe you will have about uh, in this in this panel so the places that you sh uh, saw in the in the examples are the places that are from the artist, the places from the psychiatrist, and also the place that these people gave to these different artists in these different moments of the art and different moments of the history of outsider art. The second part of my contribution is about Belgium, because, of course, I'm from Belgium, <laughs> and since the 80s, uh, I'm going to see lots of studios. So uh, in the beginning of the 80s, you, you will see in the next image one of the first, though that's another image from Josef Hofer, from his remarkable work, uh, where in fact maybe we can come back to that image because the place for Hofer is very important also because his creation place is his room. And in his room he has that mirror. And in fact, the place in which he creates is that mirror. He's showing himself in that mirror. And all the world, all this place, in fact, in his work is that mirror. So the next is Belgium with uh, some important places in Belgium, some important artists in Belgium. Here you see a few examples from artists uh, that are working or worked in, uh, in Belgium. And I wanted to show also the first image of uh, a studio uh, that you see in the next image, the studio of the home André Livemont. And here you see, in fact, the place in which they create that was a cellar. Uh, so there were no windows. And uh, Bruno Gérard was responsible for that studio. Afterwards, he became responsible for Atelier La Pommerée. Um, and in fact, it was really the beginning. And what is so specific for Belgium, I think, uh, maybe some people will have other examples of that, but is that these studios were run by artists and not by therapists or ergotherape ergotherapists, but really by artists that had a known artistic work. And that's, in that way, they also have... Um, a dialogue with the creators that is different than therapists, I think. So in the Homme André Livemont, you have uh, different, very important artists that came out of there, like Jean-Marie Elligan. But the most important artist, one of the most important artists that you will see on the next image, is of course Paul Duhem, that is known in the whole world, uh, and also in the States, because uh, I used to, to know Judith Saslow that came to, to Belgium and to Brussels and to visit also the studio of Paul Duhem. So Paul Duhem created very late in his, uh, in his, at a late age, he was 70 years old, uh, and he came in La Pomerie at that age and began to, to, to make drawings at that age. And Bruno Gerard that you see on the right, that is responsible for that studio, in the beginning was thinking, what, what am I going to do with this man that never made a drawing? But in fact, Paul Duhem made more than 5,000 5, drawings at, till the end of his life. Because for him, he had a place in the society through his artwork. So that's also a very important element for outsider art, is that the place 
that the art creates for that pe these people that can't always defend themselves, but they are defended by other people, like here uh, Bruno Gerard for Paul Duhem, for example, or uh, other people that are very important in their in their lifetime. What's also interesting to say is that Paul Duhem only made two things in his life: only drew himself, kind of portraits that are kind of self-portraits, and also houses. And it's maybe a way of showing that on the first time he exists, he has a place in the society through these portraits. And also the house is a place and he had never a house in his life. So it was also a way of uh, ex uh, showing that he exists in the society. And through his artwork, he existed and he knew a very international career through, through uh, his artwork. So um, the next image is another artist to who I want to uh, pay a tribute today because he died a few days ago and tomorrow he will be buried. Um, he's Jacques Trovic who made fantastic embroideries and here again the place is very important in his career. The place in the first time was a little house in which he lived with his with his mother and his sister uh, in the mine region in the north of France and where he made these embroideries together with his mother and with his sister. And then uh, after a few years, uh, Bruno Gerard proposed him to come to La Pommerie. And that's where he ended his life because when his sister died, it was very difficult for him to live alone, uh, to sustain himself. And that's why La Pommerie became the place where he could create and where he lived a very, very good life, the end of the 10 years uh, of, his, of his existence. And in the next image, you see two examples. In the next image, you see two examples of his creation. On the left, it's a, a piece that is called Le Tierce, uh, so the horse uh, running, or, or how do you say that in, in English? And on the right, you have the uh, the symbol of Saint Barbe, that is the saint from the mine workers, because he was, like I told, he was born in that region. And there again, the place in his work is also very important because it are his roots, his uh, cultural roots that he show uh, in this artwork. A little anecdote, the left, the left work is around eight meters uh, big and he made it on, uh, the, on the kitchen table in the house, in the little house. And he never made a sketch of the works. And everything is always correct. So it's incredible how he could make uh, these works. The next image... Um, oh, I don't see what it is. Well, it doesn't... Ah, well, it was an image from La S. La S is a studio also in Belgium. I wanted to show an image of that studio because it's a more recent studio in Belgium, in Vielsalm, that is very well known internationally. And what I wanted to show here is the dialogue between the outsider artists and a um, regular artist. And La S is a place where uh, these people work together. And that's also an interesting evolution in the outsider art world, art world to see how you have the dialogue even in the studios between regular artists and outsider artists. And there again, the place is the way, the place where they come together and when they create together. There are lots of questions that you can ask also about that creation together at four hands. Is it good? Is it not good? That's another question, but the place where they come together is also very important in their creation. In the next image, you see another important Belgian artist that you know maybe also in the States, it's uh, Marta Grunenwald. Uh, and she began to create also at a late age, at 70, uh, when she came to her daughter that she couldn't raise, uh, and she began also to draw on the kitchen table. And she also uh, made these portraits of women. And here again, the place was important in her creation because it was the place where her daughter um, gave her the possibility to create. But in the beginning, when she made these drawings with um, 
with the pencils for my grandchildren, the people from the family were asking, what is she doing? What is this? And then afterwards, by people like uh, Madeleine Lomel from La Racine or Françoise Henrion from Aron Marge, they came to see her. They presented her work to a public. And the place of creation became also a place of diffusion and of exposure of this person and of this artwork. And the, the family looked at her another way than they looked to her before. It was a grandmother that was a little bit crazy and that made so such a drawings in the in the kitchen. But afterwards they understood that she also had her place in the society through a uh, hard work. That was also a very important element. So you see she was not working in studio, she was working individually. Like also the next example uh, from a very important artist in Belgium, and that is Robert Garcet. And he made an incredible tower, that is the Tower of Eben Ezel. Uh, it's uh, nearby uh, the, the Holland border, Netherlands. It's 33 meters high. And here again, um, it, it was a visionary artist. He didn't consider himself as an outsider artist, and his son neither, but because his son is really also believing in the way that his uh, father was revisiting, in fact, the history of humanity. Um, and he made that tower, and you see it in the next image, he made that tower next um, to... Um, to a flint carry. So he took his, the, the, the stones, in fact, there, and he made the tower next to this, uh, this place. So there again, the place of creation is linked with the place where he could find the stones to make his artwork. He was also a very activist. Uh, he was against the war and his artwork was also a, a kind of message uh, for the society. Uh, in the difference of the other artists that I showed, here you have the, an activist, it's an artist with a mission that wants to show something and that wants to change something in the society. And the last image that I wanted to show was uh, the image of curating uh, outside the art um, with the image of that um, that model of the Garcet Tower, this was shown by Harald Zeman, uh, the curator, the Swiss curator, who often showed outsider art in his career. And in fact, the way that he showed this model uh, in Belgium, uh, Visionary Belgium, that was an important exhibition he made in Brussels in uh, 2005, um, gave also another lecture of the way of to look to this artwork. So I wanted to end with this, that, that the place of creation is very important. Uh, it motivates the artist. The place of showing the art is also very important. And the way that you show it can give another message about uh, an artwork. So I thank you. I, I'm very frustrated because I only see uh, Deborah. It's very good, but I don't see the people. <laughs> so uh, thank you for your attention and bye-bye. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Bye, thank you. Fantastic. That, that worked with no problems. Whew. Okay. All right. I did have a couple of remarks I wanted to make at the beginning, but I just was nervous about making sure Karin was, was here. This, this is a panel that I was very excited about and I think sort of pushed forward with the committee because um, I, you know, over and over again in, in this morning and on the bus, um, I hear, why Chicago? And um, one of the things I tell guests at Intuit is there are artists everywhere creating, but the key is acceptance. Are there people um, looking for this art, embracing these artists, opening the doors for these artists, um, making sure that when their work is found in their, in their one room on Webster Avenue in Lincoln Park, the, the whole thing isn't thrown away. Um, so um, I was excited that we could co together explore other places where creation meets acceptance. So with that, I'm going to um, ask 
um, Hans to speak next. This is Hans Luyen. He is the director of two museums. If you don't think that one museum is enough. The Dollhouse Museum of the Mind in Harlem and the Outsider Art Museum in Amsterdam, which is the only museum in the Netherlands that shows leading artworks by national and international outsider artists. And of course, um, the Outsider Art Museum is a partner for the international tour of Chicago Calling Art Against the Flow, which will be exhibited in Amsterdam in 2020. So, Hans. Very true. Yeah, okay. Okay, now let me get to the technical side. Okay. Okay, this is not me. Uh, this keep probably going. keep going. Okay, I keep going. Go, go fast. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. There you are. That's me. Okay. Yeah, there I am. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, should I do this standing up or sitting down? What's whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah. Okay. I stand up then. Thank you. Um, Deborah looked me out here to uh, share with you some insights. Why she asked uh, via email. Uh, it seems that in Europe there are so many places where outsider art flourishes. Uh, historical ones, we heard uh, the lecture of Dubuffet, the very impressive museum in Lausanne. You have the Princeton collection, you have a great museum in Lille, the north of France, uh, Lille Art Moderne, with a, wow, most impressive uh, collection. And you have other places, but you didn't have such a place in the Netherlands. Um, so, why she chose me? Well, okay. That's what it is. Um, so my tale is actually uh, like the film uh, River Runs Through It. It's a tale of three cities, three cities with three rivers in it. This is, uh, I wrote, wrote it down so you can read, it's the River Neva in St. Petersburg um, in Russia. The second one is the River Amstel, which gave his name to Amsterdam. It's a dam in the Amstel River. And the third one is the Sparna River, which is the river on um, which borders Harlem, the original one, um, originated. So Amsterdam had a new place, later they called it New York, at Harlem Stick, Brooklyn, that's Brooklyn, in Stick, Staten Island, Coney Island, well, you have all these places which derive from Dutch names. So this is the Hermitage Palace. Uh, it was created by Catherine the Great, uh, a German princess who kicked her husband out, who was to be the, become the Tsar, and who became a very, very important Tsar. And she scooped up all kind of uh, great collections uh, we just let go. So rich gentlemen in the Netherlands, traders, they had these very important collections. They would die, and the family think, ah, let's flog it all, and let's go for the money. And Catherine would buy it, or her her people would buy it. And this is what it looks like. It's like an enormous sugar cake uh, and where you get lost. And uh, it was extended by the successive Tsars until it became a museum in 8080, but only open for the elite. So the friends of the Tsar, they could, if they were well dressed, they could go and see all these treasures. And, and after the revolution, uh, one very good decision was taken. It was said immediately, this is property of the people. So don't take it home, just leave it here, and let's admire it here. The second place, is this is the Hermitage, Amsterdam. So what happened? This was an elderly care facility from the 17th century at the border of the Amstel River. Um, it was very outdated, and uh, this very inspirational man who did exhibitions in, in the new church at Dam Square, he said, let's create a a museum here, a Hermitage, Amsterdam. So we bring over collections from the Hermitage St. Petersburg, temporary exhibitions, and uh, we show it to the public. And the director of Hermitage uh, St. Petersburg said, crazy, but what a great idea, let's do it. So that happened, next year it's 10 years, and here you can see an overview of the gallery. So this is Rubens and all the Flemish masters, um, but they also do, did the first exhibition was dining with the Tsars, so all about banquets and state banquets and all the porcelain. And earlier this year they had Dutch masters, great. So all the Rembrandts and, and, and balls and whatever, they came home for the first time in 400 years. So it's quite an event. 
And this is the third place. This is Dollhouse, Museum of the Mind. So you see this old complex. Um, everything with the red roof tiles on, on the right is the original complex. And it was outside the city because it was a quarantine building for people with illnesses. The city of Harlem didn't want within its borders. So it was a leprosy. It was an asylum, which is the name, the meaning of the word dollhouse. Doll is someone who is not fit mentally, and house is house, so it's very close. And in the 19th century, century the city uh, expanded, and so now it's part of, of the city. And actually, we're celebrating next year our 700th year anniversary. So this chapel is from 1319. It's pretty impressive, and it's in need of repair. So, okay, but that's all going to happen. Um, and we started out as a museum of psychiatry in 2005, and the main question is, what's the difference? Where's the boundary between normality and abnormality? It's a historic picture of it. So it was a very closed um, complex, and to the right you see a gable stone from another asylum from the south of the Netherlands. So you see, there's always been the question, um, is, are people violent or are they just innocent, doing nothing? but not contributing to society. So the gentleman on the left, he's biting his arm, so he's probably very uh, dangerous. He's, he's a dull person. And to the right, someone is holding a cloth and just uh, preventing to drool all over the place. And there's some small kids standing to the people. And you can see cells on the back and even a chain. So people were chained. And these walls now are the walls which were erected to exclude people uh, for our story about inclusion. So what we do, we give a voice and we, we are a platform for people who were not heard and not represented within the culture and within museums and within the arts. That's what we did in Harlem and that's what we're doing at the Outsider Art Museum in the Hermitage, Amsterdam. Okay. Uh, Deborah said I should be quick, so I, this is the theory behind it. We concentrate on neurodiversity. Ask me later. Um, but anyway, we did an exhibition in 2015, Essentials. Um, we have a lot of ateliers and workshops in the Netherlands uh, linked to care facilities. And uh, because of cutbacks, uh, many of them are struggling, and some of them even were at the brink of closing down, and we said that's an outrage, so let's create an exhibition in which we highlight uh, what these artists are doing and what is facilitated by these, uh, these workshops, these ateliers. Uh, and here you see one of the artists. So we had an open call. Uh, bring on your artworks, bring it themselves, uh, what you like, what you want. And we had a few curators who helped make a distinction between the best and the very best and the not so good. Um, and we said that in a friendly way. So we were looking for quality, just quality. And this gentleman, he's on the table, he's wearing his suit, he's making work on paper, he's, wearing, he's painting his clothes, and he's doing movements all within the same framework. And from that idea originated the Outsider Art Museum in the Hermitage. Um, this is about is speaking about young people, so they're very interested in outside art. This is where they all take pictures and probably post it on, on Instagram or whatsoever. And the Hermitage Amsterdam is basically a museum with three um, venues under one roof. So you have their own exhibitions, like here the Dutch Masters. You see Flora from Rembrandt, who was home. Um, Underneath you have the brothers and sisters of the Nightwatch, huge paintings of these gentlemen clubs, um, and they were painted in a more conventional way than Rembrandt did it, that's why it was a, such a scandal. Um, and that's a permanent, permanent museum, with a collection from the Rijksmuseum and the Amsterdam Museum. And we are the third edition, at the, so the branch on the tree, the outside art museum here at the opening of China. Part of the project is uh, a gallery and um, ateliers for artists. There's now 16, 16 artists working within um, 
the building. And this is managed by a healthcare organization called Cordaan, which is our partner next to Hermitage, Amsterdam. And we were extremely lucky that the Queen said yes to the opening. And um, so 14th of March, 2016, I stood on her toes. It's true. You can see she has huge pumps. I had new shoes with points as well. And we crossed the toes. So I excused myself and she said, oh, that's okay. That's, that's, she didn't mind. And we continued the tour. So phew, it was a big moment in my life, yeah. Um, and that, of course, helped us enormously. Uh, so you can talk about places, you can talk about facilitating things, but if someone like Queen Maxima from Argentina, who's popular all over the world, uh, opens your museum, that helps enormously. So that's talking about breaking stigma. Um, we were in Clarín in, Argent in Argentine magazine, in, in Paris Match, in everywhere. Okay, they were talking about the close of Maxima, but still we were in all these magazines and they, we were mentioned, which is important. Um, and the Outside Art Museum focuses on contemporary outside art. I stick to the term, although some people oppose to it. Um, when Roger Cardinal wrote a book on how to view the ideas of Dubuffet and uh, with tips for collectors, he came to his English publisher in 72, and the English publisher said, but how are we going to call the book? Well, uh, how to collect Art Bru. And the publisher almost fainted, like, I cannot uh, present that to my readers. Nobody will understand what Art Bru is about. So Roger Cardinal, he protested, and they had a discussion, and the publisher said, but what is Art Bru then? Explain to me what it is. And uh, Roger Cardinal said, well, you have the stage, like in the theater, with all these artists, and you have the well-known artists, and they have the spotlight on them, and they have the text, and they are in the center stage, and then you have these other artists, and some have non no text, some you can hardly see, and they're artists which are doing their own thing, uh, they're not included in the play, they're not following the script, they're doing it completely their own thing. Oh, so they're outside the limelight. So they're outsiders. No, yeah, yeah, no, outside the limelight. I call the book Outside the Art. Well, okay, so clearly Roger lost this discussion, um, and in the book you will not find the term Outside the Art. It's only on the cover, but it became very famous. And because of that explanation, I stick to outside art. Because we bring to light art which has not been seen before. Um, as we did with our opening show, um, Japanese uh, outside art compared to other works of art from Europe, also the Netherlands. Mm, yeah, Because in 2013, we had the Venice Biennale. Uh, the biggest uh, Porsche's art show in the world. Very 19th century con concept. All these countries come in and bring the best art and compete. And I don't know if they do medals anymore, but they did for a long time. In comes Massimilio Gioni from the Noise Museum in New York. And he creates this uh, main exhibition, the Encyclopedic Palace, which you see here from this American-Italian gentleman who worked in his garage for years to create the uh, museum which should have been built on the Washington Mall containing all the art and knowledge of the world. Somehow that didn't happen, but we still have the model. And um, Massimiliano, is, Mr. Massimiliano is investigating the origins of creativity. So he goes back, in my opinion, to the ideas of Dubuffet. He's not mentioning outside art, he's not mentioning art brew, but he's including over 20% of works by unknown, untrained artists in his exhibition. And that's what magic happens. Even the big shots in the Netherlands from the modern art museums finally open up for this art. Because we had one director of a very famous museum, museum I won't say names, but if you approach me later, I will. I will gossip. And it was a he said that, yeah, like I said, our, our brew is like a children's painting. Sometimes they got it right. Incredible. This dinosaur is still around, and sometimes we cross paths and then we lock horns. Um, 
But so what we're doing is opening doors, literally, and um, bringing to light this art, which deserves to be on the main stage and be seen. And if the public disregard it, it's fine by me. But I want them to have a look and uh, form their opinion about, about the art. So we're going places. This is the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. They are thrilled about the idea of the Outside Art Museum, and we're working with them now. Not only are they taking our exhibition uh, on Willem van Genk, which we're doing uh, later next year, but also we are signing uh, a cooperation agreement to create a center for social inclusion in the Hermitage within the museum facilities, which they will then hand over to other museums in Russia, which is a big thing. Um, I have to go fast. Okay, we went to China. <laughs> and we brought China home. <laughs> um, but no, okay, this, this is uh, great. So if we did the first exhibition on Chinese outdoor art outside China, Wu Mei Fei to the right, um, he just kind of a meditation, just putting his, clicking his pen on paper, which, which calms him down. Uh, to the left, uh, a boy from Beijing who wants to master arithmetic because then he can go back to school. Um, yeah, great, great works. And something very interesting, sometimes you see parallels, people doing the same, same uh, subjects or uh, finding the same forms. It's, it's amazing. So it's, it's an international visual language. Um, the exhibition you just mentioned on, on the visit of Dubuffet to uh, Prinzhorn, we, we took that too. Um, so we got, went back to the roots of outside art and, and studied the ideas of, of Dubuffet, and especially his comment on, on this first uh, important collection. Um, and we were able to uh, involve the Rijksmuseum and the Stedelijk Museum, uh, Museum of Modern Art, um, in the summer of Dubuffet, they had several exhibitions coinciding with us and doing art talks and, and so on. So really we're trying to create waves within the larger uh, art and museum community to uh, make a place for, for this incredible art. We did a, for a symposium in Petersburg, I go fast. Um, we participated in art fairs in Amsterdam just to get the idea uh, of this art out there. We don't sell but we just showed it and we involved the artists so they explained their work they gave tar uh, guided tours um, did art talks with experts on the table and together with the Dutch masters we did this exhibition new masters which probably will be within the vicinity within the new near future yes uh, yes I think it will come to the United States so it's um, a combination of photography by an acclaimed uh, photographer, Sandra Trulsta, who won the silver camera, that's the highest uh, photography prize for his portraits. And at first I was reluctant. I thought, should we do this? And should we do this this way? Um, portraits of the artists. Um, we have to include the artworks. Yes, we do. We did, we included the artworks. And then I thought, okay, we do the artwork center stage and you look like a, a ring around it with the portraits. But we were doing staging the show and the photographer said, I think the combination could work. And we set up the whole show in combinations and it works like you would never see. And I think you have to see it to either discard it or agree, but it works. Sometimes the, um, the, the, the postures, the, the, you say, is that, a, is that a respectful English word? The posture is good, yeah. Posture the, the, the artist takes and his work are, well, of, of a similarity which is, which is incredible. Like here with, uh, with Noel. So the photographer didn't know we had this work in our collection. But I think, yeah. So when you have, have these next to each other, that's it's great. Uh, we had an, an installation of a room by uh, this gentleman, um, René van Asch who just don't stop on his paper, he writes on the wall and on his table and on his window still. And we had the whole room. How much? Okay, that's a wrap. No, okay, and we included the artists. Um, 
and we were able to uh, go to uh, to Shanghai uh, last year. And the last thing I want to share with you is that I think is very important. So we give stage to the to the artist, and this artist Lionel Pluck, who is also on the poster of uh, New Masters, he is now picked up by a major gallery in the Netherlands. This is the opening of his show, and it was also um, trained artist exhibition. Didn't sell anything, and Lionel almost sold out. Um, he's included in, in, in major art exhibits, so uh, that's incredible. And this is Willem van Genk, for those who know him. Um, his station, this is what we could acquire from a niece, from his family. It's, 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 a, bit, it's a bit our darker, yeah. Um, and we're going to do a major show, and it's going to go to Lausanne and to the Hermitage. So, I'll leave it with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans, for opening doors for new Dutch masters. Jerry Steffel divided his time between teaching for 33 years at Carl Sandburg High School and being an adjunct professor. Adjunct? Full professor. Adjunct. Adjunct. That's the best way. Never gave me the books, you know. That's all right. But I'm adjunct, too. I, I, that's the best way. At the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where he focused on training art educators at the college level until his... Retirement just a couple months ago. Yeah. Um, he is also a recipient of the National Art Educators Association Lifetime Achievement Award. And Jerry has led many, many student trips to various locations um, domestically and internationally to look at outsider art and environment. So, Jerry. Can I use the. Uh... Yes, you can. Okay. Yep. Okay, I got the clicker. If you have seizures, don't watch because I'm going to go through my images rather quickly. <laughs> Can I move this a little bit? I want to be able to see what I'm doing here. I need a free hand to work with my trifocals so I can get a reading lens there. Ah, okay. Uh, being extremely anal, I had to look up place and space to begin with. Let me see what my time is. Okay. Uh, so let's think about those definitions of both uh, space and place to help frame how I'm going to approach uh, the subject set down for this uh, summit topic. Space. It's defined as a continuous boundless extension in all directions. An interval of time, a period, a little while. With place, we have a definite locality or location, space regarded as an abode or quarters, a town, a position in relative order. Can you hear me? Lower this. I don't want to knock anything over. Okay. Uh, so the whole idea of placing items or objects in a particular space within a particular place becomes design. And I think that's what we're talking about with the uh, lens of the five different individuals who have left an imprint on the local landscape or place through the construction of rather awe-inspiring constructions, not only in Europe, but also in the United States, with one artist who created a world within a confined space uh, yet encountered an imaginative world through place. So, let's make this advance and I'll see where I'm going. Let's start uh, in, in France with the Palais Ideal. When investigating the lasting legacy of uh, Cheval's Palais Ideal, it becomes astounding how this postman conceived this extraordinary architectural gem. Cheval described himself as a humble peasant with no learning yet was able to imagine a palace designed within classical perspective, Middle Eastern sensibilities, Moorish arches, and Gothic buttressing. His contemporaries described him as an architect of the useless. Here we see a photograph of Cheval and the rock that he tripped on, which started him on this whole exploration of, I'm gonna start collecting rocks from the neighborhood. Okay. Yet today, when one researches or searches for the top-rated attractions of the area around Hauteville, France, Palais Ideal is rated as the top attraction with thousands of people visiting yearly. 
Cheval's postal route took him 32 kilometers or close to 20 miles per day on his just normal everyday route. He would find perfect rocks or rocks that he was interested in, put them in piles, and return at night for an extra five to 12 miles to collect them in his trusted little wheelbarrow. The hillsides, the ravines, the rivers had the best stones, which were worn by centuries. He started working on Palais Ideal at the age of 43 and worked for 33 years on realizing his vision. The eastern elevation took seven years to construct. Now Cheval did look at na the National Geographic of the time. Uh, it was called La Magazine Picturesque, and they had architectural temples, Moorish buildings, palaces, uh, places in the United States, Europe, the Middle East, China, uh, you name it, it was in there. They explored animals from various regions. Uh, they looked at different individuals that uh, had made an impact on the histories of the areas. And these were all steel engravings, and he would work from that. So he did have a knowledge of what was going on in other parts of the world, even though he didn't travel uh, to those places. The western facade unites civilizations with the Hindu temple, Swiss chalet, a white house, and a castle. Slide six, the four columns signified the unity of religions, and here you have a closer uh, example of the, uh, the uh, Moorish temple. The southern and northern elevations, the mosque and its minarets on the left, and on the right, you have the north facade, sorry, I just went a little bit too fast, uh, the north facade and the smaller galleries and animals. The interior gallery and the promenade uh, are filled with bas-reliefs of animals, of places, of decorative motifs, and is probably the most um, fragile of any of those. Staying in France, we come to Picassiette. By being in a certain place at a certain time and being inspired by the surrounding vistas and materials allowed Raymond Isidore to realize a desire to embellish his home. And he did. He was mockingly called Picassiette, or the stealer, scrounger, or the Picasso of plates. Isidore conformed his space into a mosaic of beauty and solitude after building his house in 1929. In 1981, the town of Chartres increased its heritage with the acquisition of this spontaneous architecture and became a historic, historic monument in 1983. The Cathedral of Chartres has been a monument in the area for over eight centuries. And he was so inspired uh, by his vista of Chartres that the cathedral plays in a very prominent part in the mosaics and the decorations that he had. Once his house was completed, to put a quote unquote roof over our heads, he fully explored the surrounding landscape. Starting in 1938, he began collecting little bits and pieces of broken glass, fragments of china, broken crockery. Quote, I picked out the good stuff and decided to throw away the bad. A very curatorial decision, I would say. He envisioned nothing but partial decoration limited to the walls of the interior of his home. After 25 years, he not only decorated his interior, but the entire exterior walls, floors, and every item in the house and uh, gardens. He colored his cement to help create whatever mood he was envisioning for that particular room, patio, etc. It makes one wonder how a family of five lived while the house was being decorated with the grout drying on furniture or setting the mosaic patterns on the floors in the three main rooms of the house. Where did he stall, store all these materials that he had? I mean, when I was there, it was like, wow, what, what did he do with all that stuff? <laughs> uh, the black courtyard is really splendid with imagery of the cathedral itself, the Cathedral of Chartres, and images of the rose windows that you can see 
on the left there made up the mosaic on the patio floor. He also had a black throne that he could sit at at the end of the day contemplating Chartres itself, the village, and uh, the view of the cathedral. The chapel was built into the east wall of the house between 1953 and 1956. His skill level really comes into play with this where the barrel vault of the roof uh, reverberates and echoes with your voice. So if you're singing or anything, which many people did when we were there, the reverberation just kind of echoes within a chamber and it's really quite beautiful. And then in the ceiling, he used little bits and pieces of broken angels, so they're all kind of looking down at you while you're in there uh, really being very foolish by singing and uh, talking like that. The medieval ch uh, cathedral of Chartres, uh, this was basically the view that he had of the cathedral, and it was constructed between 1193 and 1250, so it has dominated the landscape of the city for over 800 years. These images of the cathedral inspired Isidore's deep religious faith while constructing his mosaics or paintings. And he used the flower images that appear on the floors of the house, in the gardens, along with the rose windows, and it was all taken from the rose windows inside of uh, Chartres itself. Coming back across the United States, I wanna just go into Fred Smith's concrete park a little bit. Moving from architectural monuments to the human spirit, to the vision of one man to depict the local, regional, and national stories, illustrating Wisconsin history along with the national identity of popular culture. He includes uh, Ben-Hur's chariot race and, his, and of historical significance, the Lincoln Todd Memorial. The map of where the sculptures are placed illustrates the density of the area. So you can see how jam-packed everything is uh, within this space. It's located right along Highway 13 in Phillips, Wisconsin, and the figures, I mean, the first time I was there, the figures do seem to beckon you like, come on in, they're right there on the road, and uh, they're staring at you, so it's, it's really quite magical. They just command your attention. There are 237 concrete and mixed media sculptures that were built between 1948 and 1964. This outdoor museum was created by Fred Smith, who also ran the Rock Garden Tavern right next door to his home, where he was able to save all the beer bottles and use it in the decorations of these uh, incredible sculptures. He had a personal vision to animate his surroundings, his surrounding space, with historical imagery and felt people needed to see it where it was built and juxtaposed with one sculpture to the next, which really does add to the feeling of uh, the entire space that these incredible sculptures are in. Uh, the tavern did provide him with a lot of Rhinelander beer bottles. So, and people donated bottles, reflectors, china, and all matter of other materials that he could use to incorporate them into uh, his sculptures. He also utilized uh, natural skulls of animals before prov uh, proceeding to embellish them. The space occupied by the sculptures animates them with weather changes. I once visited after a snowstorm, and it was a light snowstorm, but to see everything magically covered in white, the sun came out, everything melted, the wind picked up, and the leaves on the trees were rustling, uh, they were falling on the ground, so the whole space became extremely animated. It was really a magical moment. Fred Smith celebrated his knowledge of Wisconsin history and wanted to share his park with anyone who professed interest in seeing it. Then we're gonna move to Dickeyville, Wisconsin. It's something in the cheese in Wisconsin, I'm sure. <laughs> but so far we have viewed the passion of the individual to design and construct monumental ar architectural pieces or an indoor museum depicting local, regional, and national sculptures. We might think these self-taught artists are simply working alone. In Dickeyville, a parish in southwestern Wisconsin, Father Matthias uh, Wernius spearheaded his parish to construct a grotto of Christ and the King and Mary's mother, along with the grotto of the Holy Eucharist, uh, crucifixion group and soldiers' memorial, 
patriotism uh, shrine, and smaller fenced gardens within the parish uh, property. Work began in 1918 and was de dedicated on September 14th in 1930. Coming from the uh, German-speaking uh, part of Belgium, Father Wernius was aware of the various grottos in Europe, whether they be constructed by a particular parish or constructed by individuals on their personal properties. His cousins from Europe acted as his housekeepers and helped construct the Holy Ghost Park. Other parishioners helped construct the iron used as supports for the cement, along with the groundskeeper who worked almost daily to build different aspects of the uh, park on church land. Others helped make molds, mix concrete, and haul rocks and fill the uh, site. Some were hired to help finish the job at hand when money uh, was available. Parishioners were asked to fund the project, which was common practice when construction was needed on the church itself, along with the school uh, that Father Wernius began in uh, 1918 or 1920. Detailed records were kept about the amount of money parishioners had dedicated to this project, the amount of money actually given, the amount of time that they worked on uh, the construction, you know, the time that they pledged, how much their horses contributed to hauling rock and stone, and uh, the hours committed to all the construction. The children in the school were also asked to work on the construction. Girls were given the task of washing rocks and glass, while boys were asked to carry actual materials. People contributed objects to be placed as decoration in the park and the grotto. People recall saving all plates and glasses that broke during the year and taking them to the church. Intact items were also donated, such as commemorative items and ceramic figures. Even the Ford Motor Company donated gear shift knobs, and that's where you have all these perfectly uh, placed sp uh, spheres all over various parts of the grotto, which is something I just learned this summer when we went. The Columbus Monument, the way these little rosettes were, and they talk about his one cousin who made these rosettes, and when she'd come into the church, her hands were all cut and bloody <laughs> from <laughs> putting all these glass shards into the uh, concrete. Now, I want, in conclusion, the thought of space and place seems right to reflect on Henry Darger, who within his very confined living space was able to construct an entire world, a world with maps of many nations that he imagined, landscapes of numerous uh, kinds, along with character sketches of the people populating his epic narrative. His traced and colored and collaged images move from the sublime to suspenseful, ultimately to horrific. So this entire complex world that has been constructed in his small room expands the challenges uh, to us since his death in 1973. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry, for taking us farther around the world. And um, as you all know, we heard from Edward earlier today, but I'll just remind you, he's an art critic, art historian, graphic designer, curator, the senior editor of Raw Vision, and a member of the advisory council of the Collection de l'Art Brut, the muse museum in Lausanne, Switzerland, which is the third stop on the Chicago Calling European tour. So Edward, what do you have to add to our discussion today? Well, since I'm here, <coughs> rather impromptu, thank you for your invitation, uh, without a prepared a, a visual accompaniment to my remarks. I've been thinking about the theme of the panel, and I would like to share with you some remarks about place with regard to Japan, creativity by Japanese art brute self-taught artists working today, how they are rooted in their particular places, and this is directly related to the research I've been doing on the big exhibition that I am curating for the Collection de la Brute in Lausanne, Switzerland, which will open on November 29 and run for five months until the end of 
April of next year. So if you happen to be passing through Switzerland, please go to Lausanne, a beautiful city on the lake, see the exhibition, have lunch, and put, put away a great friend, uh, Swiss wine. <laughs> now, as a Japan scholar, because I actually wear two hats as, a, as an art historian. One is uh, looking at Japanese modernism, and the other is uh, in the field of art brut, outsider art. So for me, the Swiss project is a dream project because it brings together three of my abiding interests. One is Switzerland, which is where I grew up. Another is Japan, the culture of Japan that I've been involved with for 30 plus years as a translator and researcher, etc. And third, this field of outsider art, art brut. It's a dream project for me. And the research that has fed into the project, um, there has been so much in the research, so many interesting discoveries, not everything can be shared via the exhibition, so there will be other essays and books to come, I hope. But on this theme of place, and artists rooted in a place, I'd like to bookend my brief remark today with two observations from two different writers. The first is from the American art historian Lucy Lepard, whose work you might know. In the 1960s and 1970s, she was particularly prominent, and the work that she did on the history of conceptual art was particularly um, uh, important and pioneering. In the late 90s, Lucy Lepard published a book called The Lure of the Local. She divides her time, even to this day, between Maine and New Mexico. She describes herself today as retired from the art world. And Lucy Lepard's book, The Lure of the Local, in the, in the late 1990s, examined the so-called sense of place, how people uh, instinctively want and need a so-called sense of place. And she referred to our multi-centered times and how, this was pre-internet, pre-internet pre as we know it today. So she was already anticipating a sense of disorientation that uh, today's technologically uh, obsessed and driven society created for many people. She was fortunate, she says in her book, that she had a sense of place rooted in Maine, where she grew up, and then later in life in New Mexico, where she had created another home. Japan. The artists I examined and whose work I'm showing in the exhibition that will open soon in Switzerland. Over a period of three years, I was traveling the length and breadth of the country looking at artists who were making work in their homes, in studios, in, in their towns, and in some cases at workshops run by institutions for uh, disabled people, people who would go several times a week to take part in the workshop and avail themselves of, of the facilities and materials at the workshops. All right, I'd like to cite a few examples of these Japanese artists. Unfortunately, you cannot see their work, but I'll try to evoke vividly uh, their personalities and the kind of art that they make and why and how their activity as art makers is very much linked to particular places. One is an artist named um, Masakatsu Tagami. Tagami must be in his 70s now and lives in the south of the country in the prefecture of Yamaguchi, which is on the southwestern coast of Japan just across from a group of islands, and this uh, waterway between the mainland of Honshu, the main island of Japan, and the islands across from the coastline is known as Japan's inland sea. It's a beautiful, beautiful part of the country. He lives in Yamaguchi Ken with his wife who works in her, their local town. I believe she's a retired school teacher who has some other kind of job in a shop nowadays. They live very modestly. He held jobs in the past, but to now, nowadays lives at home, spends all of his time at home. It's an old traditional Japanese wooden house. Imagine the pictures you've seen of old Japanese wooden houses with the long overhanging eaves. And part of the house actually dates to the Edo period, which is astonishing, with a dirt floor. And throughout the house, Tagami works on his drawings and unusually for self-taught artists, Prince. He's a very skilled maker of prints, etchings, and um, 
other kinds of monoprints that he makes. He's very prolific. He makes thousands of little postcard-sized drawings on scrap paper, found paper, and some are abstract, some are pictures of animals, some are pictures of random patterns. The prints also feature in abstractions, pictures of skies, birds, houses, a very diverse body of work. But everything is made there, in the house. He told me when I visited him three years ago that he could not make his art anywhere else. That the house informs his uh, art making approach, his sensibility, and that it's almost difficult for him to let the, the artwork leave the house because he feels that the house is the repository for his creations. So there's one example of someone who is very rooted in a very specific place, his house. Another is the artist Hiroyuki Doi, about whom some of you have heard and whose work some of you have seen in exhibitions and at the, the Outsider Art Fair in New York City, for example. In the early 2000s, the late Phyllis Kind, who died just a few year, uh, weeks ago and was, as you know, a very key figure in the development of the market for outsider art, who had a gallery here in Chicago in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Phyllis began showing the work of Doi. And Doi, his drawings, some are small, some are very large. In recent years, they're the size of a tatami mat, which is more than a meter long. And his drawings are made up of thousands, thousands of tiny minuscule circles that he draws with a very fine point pen. It's a kind of pen that is bought, uh, that is sold only in Japan in art stores and stationery shops. And the point size of his pen is 0 0.0005 millimeters. It's almost like a hair point, a hair thin point. It's archival oil-based ink that he uses to draw these agglomerations of little circles that resemble clouds or topo topographic maps of some unusual terrain. And uh, he, does, he, writes, he makes these on washi, on Japanese traditional handmade paper. Well, he lives in the tiniest apartment, tiniest apartment in the eastern part of Tokyo, Asakusa, which is the last vestige of old Edo, of the old Tokyo. If you go there today, you will see some big, old, beautiful Buddhist temples. And if you just squint your eyes, you can imagine that you're back in the 1800s at the end of the Edo period, walking through the temple gates, seeing the big incense burners with the smoke arising from them. And on festival days, seeing everyone dressed up in kimono and eating traditional pastries and singing tr traditional songs. He works in a tiny apartment on his kitchen table. He's a former Blue Ribbon chef who to this day still cooks, not in restaurants as he did in the past, but he, has, he gives cooking lessons. And he will spend months working on a very big drawing on his kitchen table, unfolding section by section very carefully because he can't afford to wrinkle the paper. And for Doi, the sense of place linked to his creative activity is also very strong. He has shown his work since the early 2000s uh, publicly many times in art galleries and, out, and, and fairs. So for him, letting go, letting go of the work and allowing it to enter the world is something that he has become accustomed to. But when you visit him at his tiny studio, his house studio, and you see the rolled up drawings and the stacks of drawings that have not yet gone out into the world, you can really appreciate the intimate, intimate relationship between creator and the created work. A third artist whose uh, work interests me very much and will be in the exhibition that I'm putting together for Switzerland is a young woman named uh, Kazumi Kamaye. Kamaya makes ceramic works, and she has participated for several years in the workshop in Shiga Prefecture, which is in the mid-central, mid-southern part of Japan, just to the east of the city of Kyoto, in the prefecture of Shiga. And Shiga is like a big oval donut-shaped territory with a beautiful lake, Biwa, in the middle. Surrounding the lake, all, every town and village is known for beautiful Buddhist temples filled with the most, the most classic, uh, definitive B Buddhist works of art. 
And in fact, Shiga Prefecture's tourism agency promotes cultural tourism and encourages visitors to do the loop tour around the lake and visit villages to see the Buddhist art. But in the last 15 years, has also very seriously embraced the art brute makers of Shiga Prefecture and is promoting art brute as a key element of cultural tourism in the prefecture. And that is because there are several very um, active workshops for, for disabled people, such as Yamanami, Yamanami, which is in Shiga Prefecture, in the, in the southern part of the prefecture. And that is where Kazumi Kamaya goes to make her ceramics. She makes a kind of a sh an armature structure of these loose flowing forms and then begins to cover the forms with tiny, tiny, almost rice grain shaped beads so that the surfaces of her, her, her sculptures, which are always faces, very beautiful expressive faces, sometimes with three mouths, six ears, sometimes with three faces, and they're wobbly and they're wiggly and they're very expressive. She covers the entire surface with these little beads of clay, fires the clay unglazed. It comes out and the clay she's using comes out a kind of, kind of a metal, gunmetal gray. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, kind of color and texture. And the subject matter of her sculptures, always Mr. Yamashita. His first name is Masato. She has a big crush on him. He's the director of the institution. <laughs> so you'll see the titles of her works are things like Masato and I driving to Yokohama. <laughs> and it's the two of them in an abstract car. Or Masato peeling an orange. And there he is with three heads and three faces peeling an orange sitting at a little table. Very expressive work. So um, this notion of place and the artist being rooted in a place where he or she creates is very real. And as an art critic, I have the great pleasure to visit every year numerous artists' studios, living artists, young, old, contemporary art, modern art, outsider art makers, and to see how the places where they make their work play a role very often in the ideas they develop and in the relationship they have to the making of their works. Um, sometimes this relationship is very obvious. For example, John Crawford, an American sculptor who's probably in his early 70s now, makes big welded abstract forms and has a studio in Brooklyn that's twice the size of this room with a much higher ceiling. He needs such a space in which to have uh, very, very big equipment and welding equipment that allows him to make the kind of sculptures that he makes. So scale is related to the place, the space in which someone like Crawford works. By contrast, I just said that Doi works in the tiniest of shoeboxes and still manages to make large scale works because he adapts himself and his materials to the available space. Finally, I want to mention this uh, quotation from Basho, the 17th century uh, uh, traveler and poet who, you know, wrote a very important book, a very famous book of the Edo period called um, uh, The Deep Road to the North, in which he recalls in verse and prose his travels uh, from Tokyo, in those days Edo, the capital, all the way to the northern island of Hokkaido, including in the wintertime he traveled. And his book is a series of recollections of the people he met along the journey and the places he saw. He touches very often in the poems in the book on the sense of place of different villages and homes that he visited on the journey. But one of the most important things he says in the book is that the journey for me is my home. So the act of being in transit, the act of looking experiencing different places was for him his home. And by extension, or in comparison to such a remark, one can say that for many artists, I would say for most artists, it's the act of making the art that is in fact their home. It is the act of creation in which they are rooted. That is probably the most essential place 
a conceptual place, a place in the mind and in the spirit out of which their art flows. Thank you. As usual, Edward, you're remarkable, even on short notice. <laughs> so, any questions? Any, any questions for our, our panelists who have taken us around the world? Yes, we have a question in the back. Sander Trulstra. Sander Trulstra. Yeah. I can give it to you later. Yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to be a devil's advocate, but doesn't place always have a role in what artists create? I think, uh, you know, I mean, you think of uh, almost any artist, and it's where they live that informs what they create. So, I mean, it, so it's not exceptional to, to uh, self-taught or outsider art, right? Okay. I think it gets the self-taught artists a little bit more. It's on? It's on? Okay. I think with the self-taught artists, it really resonates a little bit more. I just think, I mean, I spent 48 years teaching at the School of the Art Institute, and it is amazing. I know the BFA show was mentioned this morning, which is an interesting show because it's a little more raw. And once you get into those MFAs, uh, they've learned what's going on in New York and other important uh, venues, and they start working towards that gallery uh, acceptance. So I don't know, it just seems that the self-taught artists are a little more honest in the way they are approaching it. I think uh, I have to agree with you that uh, it's, it's an obvious... Uh, field to explore and to be honest I struggled a bit first to think how can I address this we are a tiny country uh, we have problems to define the Dutch culture what is Dutch culture we are an open country at least we think we are we have a lot of water which cuts us off as we used uh, as connection um, and we went everywhere and brought things home not always voluntary by the, the previous owners but okay that's another subject um, but, and then I think in, in regard of outsider art that the artists are, um, they are including what's happening in their life. And, and I think for me, uh, the strongest art is where uh, the life of the artist and their work go inside. And, and that includes place, but it's not only place. No, that's my view. Uh really fascinating and wonderful presentations by all of you. And we kind of threw out this panel topic, not really defining it clearly, um, not on purpose, but I think it's because we couldn't define it so clearly. But I love how you've all um, talked about the, either the chicken and the egg or the egg and the egg of how um, place is, chosen places where artists live and reside um, impact, inform, or are their work, and how, um, which has become clear in all of your um, remarks, how places have, are, or in other places, are not receptive to all manner of works, and how, how there's, you know, a back and forth between them. And one thing that came up in Hans and Edwards' talks briefly is if and how that essential nature of the relationship between an artist and their intimate relationship with place and space is um, curated in exhibitions. Is it important to do that? Is it only something we address in catalogs? Um, or, you know, it's, it's a contemporary challenge, I think, because there's so much um, concern and attention in contemporary art with the artist's studio, however that is um, defined. Or so, or what, what should be done that hasn't been done? You're touching upon a subject that is uh, very big in, as you know, in, in museum practice nowadays. And that is particularly with regard to bringing works into the museum setting that come from a site-specific original setting, like, for example, the works of Howard Finster in the South were moved from his so-called Paradise Garden installation and brought into the museum. We know that our colleagues at the High Museum 
in Atlanta have tried to evoke the original setting of the works of Finsters that they have in their collection when they install those works. They position them, for example, um, in, at, at, at heights that, were, that are similar to the heights that one have, would have encountered in walking through the garden itself. So they try to evoke a sense of the original placement of the pieces of the Paradise Garden that are now in a museum setting. That's a kind of, that's, that's what in Europe we would call a kind of a scientific approach to the question you've asked, to ad addressing what to do with the artworks. There is a risk in that approach, which is that if it becomes too literal, then it becomes a kind of spectacle that tries to tries to recreate the original setting, but will always fall short because it can never be complete and because it's not the original place. But there is something to be said for trying to evoke a sense of the original setting for such site-specific works insofar as it gives the visitor a sense of their, literally their physical placement and maybe the ambiance. Photographs also help. Photographs of the original setting on display can help give the visitor a sense of the original character, the character of the original place. But taking artworks out of the studio, out of any art, art maker's studio, whether it's a trained so-called professional artist or an outsider artist, and putting them on display in what we now for shorthand refer to as the white box of a contemporary art gallery with white walls, bright lighting, a so-called so neutral setting, there's considerable debate actually going on right now about how effective such a setting is or not and just how neutral such a setting is and how mm, valuable such a neutral setting is insofar as that kind of a setting can be so sterile that it takes away from the artwork or it can be so neutral and pure that it accentuates the aura of the artwork. That depends on you, the viewer. Having said that, I'll give you a specific example of this debate right now as it's percolating. The Collection de l'Art Brut sponsored a symposium in Lausanne two years ago on the occasion of its 40th anniversary. And at one of the talks that was presented was on the subject of the black box versus the white box. The permanent collection of the museum in Switzerland, which is spread out over four floors, three floors and a mezzanine in this 18th century chateau, is installed in galleries with walls painted matte black and with spe uh, object-specific lighting that highlights the textures and surfaces of three-dimensional works in particular. That was, an, a, that was a decision that was made 42 years ago when the museum opened, to go with the black box rather than white box treatment of the permanent collection. The rooms in which temporary exhibitions are displayed tend to have white walls, unless this, what we call the scenic design changes and employs color, which sometimes occurs. What I find very interesting in my own background is in graphic design, is that sometimes in major museum exhibitions, certainly at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, one sees the use of color. And I personally like the use of color in exhibitions. I think it requires very careful discerning choices on the part of the curators about which colors to use as backgrounds for certain works of art. But I like color, and I don't think that curators and exhibition designers should be afraid of it. But the general uh, collective understanding these days that prevails in most museums and galleries is that white is somehow mm, a better non-color color to use to favor and accent the presence of the artworks. I uh, totally agree with you uh, here. And I think that uh, your question also involves 
uh, the whole idea of museums. Museums are strange places. You have to go there, you stand, you walk, you read, you take in new things, and, and these things are taken out of the original context. Always. There's hardly any art made in museums in the room where they're in. And uh, with outer art, I find that in many cases, the work uh, has other functions for the artists. Um, it's, it's a huge part of their lives. Um, it, it sometimes has taken over their lives, and certainly their environment. And then suddenly we come along and say, this is great, we want to display it, and we want to share this with the public. And the artist reluctantly agrees with some of his work, or her work, and then after his or her death, or if they cannot longer live in the house, uh, we want it all and we show it all. So I think that, that the, the artwork, uh, we have to present it as good and best as an artwork to the public, general public, and all these other things, the, the environment, the, the other functions, we have to document and, and present, maybe in other ways, maybe in articles, maybe in online uh, dossiers, maybe in, in films, in photography, um, I think I, I saw the the Dodgy room. Uh, I was like got smacked, and I was even allowed to step behind the little court. There was someone with me, so that was okay. Thank you, Deborah, for that. Um, I was amazing, but today I learned that that there's so much much more things which were in the room. So it's always very hard to recreate reality, um, and. So you have always have to inform the public that this is a take on reality. And yeah, you can do that on, on different levels. That's my... Yeah. I really appreciate the panel addressing the dual nature of the term place, both the place in which art is being made, but also place as uh, a place in the world, a community, a culture that was receptive to uh, bringing this art forward. So there was kind of this both sides of that um, place terminology. We've um, run late a little bit intentionally because we had such a rich conversation we didn't um, have any place to, to send you off to immediately. I want to thank the panelists so much for this session and we will send your thank yous to Karin as well. Thank you.